an outstanding bike. Thank you for coming over. Hey, Mike, thanks for thanks for having me over. We've been talking about it for a bit. Glad we could make it. What a beautiful day. Well, this is my 1972 Dunstall Norton 810, and uh, it's an original Dunstall Norton 810. And I want to kind of tell you a little bit about what Paul Dunstall did with this bike, you know, compared to a stock Norton. Uh, but I can I can verify that it's the original because I'm the original owner. So maybe a little later we can take a look at an invoice and you can see that it was purchased. So uh, yeah, so this is a Dunstall Organization 810. I say Dunstall Organization because Paul began to grow the company a little bit and have people come on board to help him out. So I thought I'd point out a few things that might be different, that are different over a 750 Commando. So on the engine, Paul did a light alloy barrel, the cylinder and it was uh, wide enough where he could bore it out, make it into an 810. Saved about 10 pounds, I understand, on, on doing that with the cylinder. He uh, took the head and dunstalized the head. So the, the, from the 750, uh, he re-sphered the combustion chamber and did some machine work actually got in and uh, increased the uh, size of the valves, changed the valve angle in the head. He put in multi-tension springs on the, on the valve springs for those that are technical. He did uh, lightweight cam followers on, on this engine. These are the 932 uh, Amel carburetors. And in 1972, Norton introduced the combat engine. So my understanding is they had the 932s. Paul kept the 932s. Uh, what's interesting, the year before, he had a uh, carburetor intake manifold that was sprung on rubber and found that uh, between isoelastic vibrations and his carbs vibrating, he was just frothing the fuel. So that all changed for 72 and went back to that solid manifold. Down on the exhaust side, Dunstall partnered with a fellow named Gordon Blair, who was a mechanical engineer in Ireland. Uh, that did a lot of uh, machine work and gas flow work. And Gordon Blair designed this two into one, back into two exhaust system. My understanding is that uh, Dunstall himself, or worked with an associate of Gordon Blair, came up with the uh, Dunstall decibel silencers that are back here, which are kind of fun. Got a unique sound. When they had the two into one exhaust, uh, Dunstall designed a center stand that uh, fits in kind of around that two-into-one exhaust and it's a bit narrow and you kind of have to reach and feel to get in there and find it with your toe uh, to make that happen. Up on the front side uh, Dunstall designed the uh, dual disc brakes uh, that you see here with the calipers built right into the lower fork. He was given credit for the world's first production motorcycle that had dual disc brakes. Then uh, there's the Dunstall linkages, the rear set, the plates to hold all the linkages. Here we've got the glass work. Um, he had somebody work up that, that half fairing, three gallon tank, seat combination in fiberglass. He also had uh, the Barani WM2 uh, wheels that you see there. He considered this a Mark II. The Mark I, if you bought the full Dunstall kit, was more the Roadster, uh, and the Mark II designated the Cafe Racer. When I ordered the bike, there was a few options to have. I just checked every box. <laughs> and uh, when you're 19 years old and you don't have enough money to buy something like this, what's another few pounds? And it's fully loaded. It's fully loaded, it's fully loaded. Uh, I didn't get any floor mats out the door, but it, it's fully loaded. But I got a Quay 5-speed. And that's, that's different than what you'd find on a normal Norton 750 Commando. Why did I buy the bike? People ask me that a lot. I was one of the dirt bike kids in our neighborhood in San Diego. And so, you know, we had go-karts before we could waddle and then, you know, mini bikes and led to dirt bikes. And we were always racing around the neighborhood and in the desert did a little dirt bike racing and most guys did. I had an AMA number and raced a Montessa 250 dirt bike out in the desert actually raced that for a bit, uh, doing a TT race at Elsinore. Elsinore is famous for the Grand Prix, but I did a uh, little bring the bike up, race it. It was all in the back of the truck, seat of your pants, just, you know, young guys having fun. Led to a number of street bikes, and uh, when I was 17 or 18, I bought a uh, 1966 Harley-Davidson Sportster, an XLCH. By that time, I was pretty handy on just keeping things going, so I rebuilt the bike, and then 
took off like a knucklehead with a buddy of mine at age 18 on a trip from San Diego to Canada. The Harley was fun, but I wanted something a little bit more sporty. And uh, somewhere along the line in, in 71, I saw an article or two about Paul Dunstall. And you know, who is Paul Dunstall? What does he have? So read about it and started writing letters to Paul Dunstall uh, talking about the bike because I had a ton of questions. And he said, boy, you got questions to ask. So I picked up the phone and called one time. And that was like early days in the ship to shore. You know, if you've called internationally, it's, hello, can you hear me? Over. You know, so that didn't produce a whole lot. But at any rate, carried that forward and, you know, eventually scraped up enough money, sold a couple dirt bikes and gave Paul my money and said, uh, sure love to have you build this. There's an historic event coming up 50 years ago. I think it's October 6th. We'll take a look at the storyboard. Uh, the bike finally arrived uh, to my parents' house in San Diego. And my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, was there took some photos of me, cracked it open the, the crate. I mean, here we are, you know, 50 years later with the A-10. My primary transportation when I was, could first get a license was a motorcycle. That's how I rode. Um, the nun still came along in 72 and so did college. So I didn't ride the bike as much. Got into cars and that was became, you know, part of the industry that I was, you know, that's where I worked. But I always kept the bike, I always loved the bike. To me, back in the day, I can always remember opening up the magazine, like Psycho World 1971, and there were pictures of this gorgeous bike, and I, you just, you know, arts, you, everybody appreciates art different, but I just thought it was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen, even at 19 years old. And so, I suppose if I wasn't married, didn't have a career, didn't have kids, Dunstall probably would have been in my living room because it was a piece of art. That's how I looked at it. To this day, I just look at it and, you know, it's, come on, let's be honest, it's old technology. It's, there's so many bikes have changed over the years. And, but to me, it's just a bit of beauty. And, you know, I kept it, don't ride it much. Um, you know, barely have, I'm a little under 5,000 miles on the bike, you know, all, all original. But a couple years ago, Portland Cars and Coffee had a motorcycle show. And you'll remember, because you were there. Yeah. I decided I was going to ride down to Cars and Coffee, you know, with the bikes. I've ridden with you guys for a little bit, but you guys showed up. We hadn't talked. You were there, and I rode the bike in. The next thing, uh, the guy that organized that said, what the heck is this? And guys came around, and they made it the spotlight vehicle. And so he put out a little article about it, and that was pretty cool. Then um, I can remember you, George Kraus. By the way, George has done a fair amount of work on my bike over the years. He's our trusted guy in the Northwest with British bikes. Uh, and I'm just busy working, I never had any time. Uh, and some of it was above my pay grade anyway. But you guys had always encouraged me to consider going to Quail. And you know, I'd heard of Quail, but I thought, yeah, I don't know, maybe. And then it grew on me, the idea grew on me. So I, uh, I sent him down um, the Portland Cars and Coffee. And also I sent him down the article that I didn't mention, which was that came out, was in the Wall Street Journal. And, you know, that came about because A.J. Bame, the writer, does a weekly column on my ride. Cars, motorcycles, whatever. And uh, I wrote him. I just said, you know, here's something. And he loved the idea. He called, and we chatted, and we talked, and he wrote the article. And what was really amazing, that article came out in the Wall Street Journal in 2020. AJ called me later and said, you'll never believe this. One of our readers got a hold of me, and it's Paul Dunstall's daughter, and she lives in the United States. And she wanted to thank me, thank you for writing the article. And AJ connected me with Paul's daughter, and I wrote her an email, and uh, she connected me with Paul. So here we are, this is 2020, all these years later. And so now Paul is writing me back, and we've exchanged emails. And I mean, that was just an absolute treat. Paul told a very interesting story. He said, I remember your spec. I remember the color. I remember the time frame." And he said, at that very moment, we had a bike, he said, that may have been yours on display in London at the UK Design Center. He said, that might have been your bike on, on display. And that was a wow. And I asked him later if he had any 
any photographs or anything, and he, he said, no, no, that's that's long gone. But pretty interesting to think that that, that might have been the case. I wrote him. I wrote out an order, and I said, this is all the money I have, and I hope to sell my present motorcycle. So I gave him all my money and filled out the order. And he kind of laughed in the email that he sent me back, and he said, uh, well, we had some people that were trying to jump the queue at that particular time, and he said, uh, Steve McQueen used to call us every week wanting to get this bike. He said, I just didn't talk to him. He said, also, a fellow by the name of Zach Reynolds, he's the grandson of the Reynolds Tobacco Company, had to have one, and apparently he bought a lot of Paul's work. Paul also said that back in his shop, Wells Road, I think it is, uh, they had a guy that would show up, and uh, he was a bit of a musician, and he would sit and eat sandwiches and talk to the talk to the blokes working on the bikes, and he had to have one. His name was Emerson, and his group was Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. So there were quite a few people out there that were hoping to get the bike. 1972, Psycho World did an article, and it was their test on this bike. Uh, it was the first time they had run a production bike under 12 seconds in the quarter mile. Their ET was 11.9, and that was a first. Uh, what's fascinating about that, in that same magazine, Kawasaki had their own factory ad and they're bragging about their Mach 3 was the world's fastest production motorcycle. After knowing that this was considered the world's fastest production bike, I decided to take it to a drag strip north of where we lived, and that was at uh, Carlsbad. Carlsbad was famous for a motocross track, but they also had a drag strip. It was Saturday night, run whatever you bring. And so that was interesting. So I got up there with my buddies. Only did it, I think, two or three runs because I was running against guys that were driving the old Camaros and Mustangs, which I love old Camaros and Mustangs. But these guys were knocking back their Coors and just having a good old time. I mean, I thought I was on the scene of Greece, the movie. The last time I rode it on the quarter mile on the test, I looked over and the guy was polishing off his Coors and threw it back. And I thought, this might not be the smartest thing to do. But I wish I had the old trap ticket. I kept a lot of stuff, obviously, but I did. Uh, I ran it at 12.4 at the drag strip. I didn't hit the 11.9. My gearing is a little taller, I think, than the bike that they did. I had a chance to take it out on the track at uh, Riverside International Raceway. It was an AMA-sponsored deal for amateurs. And so it was like a track day, but we were actually racing. So uh, there was practice laps and, and actual racing. I got into a bit of a bind in the actual race. Everything was going great on the, uh, the practice runs. But uh, I can't think of the turn number at Riverside now, but it's a long, big, sweeping turn. And, you know... I'm hunkered over to where I'm like, this is going pretty fast. And suddenly my leg was kicked off the peg. And what had happened is the lay shaft had seized up a bit on the kickstart. So it literally threw the kickstart down and threw my leg off, knocked my leg right off, and I'm healed over. By the way, these, these are all ground still. Those are Riverside grind marks on the pegs. <laughs> right there, right there, right there on the original rubbers. but. So that ended, the, that ended the race day and then had to sort that out with a machine shop to kind of bore it out a little bit. I wrote Dunstall and kind of exchanged some ideas, but apparently that's happened once or twice. But once was fine for me and, and then we got past that. I've really never tried to abuse the bike, you know, respect the bike. As a cafe racer, those that ride cafe racers know, around town it's a, it can be a little hard on the arms. And where it really shines is even get out to speed because then you kind of like go neutral buoyant. You got the wind blowing <laughs> you back and you know, then you can hold back here, but. It's absolutely original then. You've done, you've done nothing more to this then, Phil? Yeah, you've no, added every, nothing, changed, everything nothing. that you're looking at is, is original on the uh, Like on you the say, bike. even the foot peg rubbers, they're absolutely yeah, new. Yeah, 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 those are the original foot peg ruggers. I, I've, over the course of years, I spot something on eBay, I'll grab it. So I've got a few little spares for whatever, but uh, uh, you're looking at all uh, all original. And uh, back to Quail, Quail was a, an amazing honor to be there and just be around some fun people and some fun bikes. So glad I went. And then the real surprise was when the judges hung the red tag and I said, well, what does that mean? And you were there. They said, well, that means that you won something, 
Uh, okay. And then one of the judges came back quietly and told me that the bike had already won uh, best of class, which was all British. And he said, you're in the running for best of show. Well, this is a storyboard that my wife and I put together for the visit to Quail, because I thought it might be of interest with some of the original documents that I've kept from the purchase of the bike. So in the upper left right over here, this is the order form. All my letters with questions, phone call and all that uh, worked into this order form. Got my name, address, and it, this is my handwriting back in August of 1972. Uh, I wanted the 810 Mark II, which I mentioned is the cafe racer as opposed to the uh, post of the roadster. I, I ordered the five speed close ratio and then other options that I wanted on the bike. And then this is the part that I talked about. Please be advised if 900 is sufficient deposit, I hope to sell my present cycle within a few weeks to cover the balance. So basically, Paul, here's all the money I have as a 19 year old kid and uh, you got the bike and you got my money. So it worked out. This document right here is the original invoice from Paul Dunstall organization. And yeah, he was accredited as a manufacturer in, in 1966, I believe. So he's considered a, you know, a manufacturer and that helped him with his racers. He could race in the production side because he was a producer. So this has got all the specs on the bike. This was an order form along from Paul and uh, purchase tax redemption form and and also this was this personal export scheme because i had to plate the bike so i plated the bike and then ran it around in california for a while without getting california place but i don't think there's anybody from dmv wouldn't be watching this with they mike <laughs> probably not and there's a statute of limitations so i'm sure i'm safe this was a western union telegram that came from paul dunstall said the machine is being dispatched 28 september from paul and lo and behold, here we go. This is the crate, showed up at my parents' house. And look at this, October 6, 1972. So I guess if the math is right, we've got a 50th birthday. We're close. Yeah, we're close. And so uh, you can see here in this picture, there's, there's a scrubby looking dude, me. And there's the bike in the crate. The front wheel was off and they had the disc tied off and a few other things. And so, you know, got it put together. This is a picture of me at Riverside Raceway with some pretty wild and crazy leathers. Uh, unfortunately, this guy right over here on a warm up lap, as I came around, he was tumbling end over end. They stopped the warm up lap. I'm kept on the back side of the track. They ambulanced him away. I don't oh. know exactly what happened. All I know is on the back side of the track, and I caught a lot of grief from my girlfriend, my parents, all my friends that were there, my pit crew because the announcer said, stop, we have a yellow Norton down on the back side of the track and we need an ambulance. I didn't hear that, they did. That was the pit crew that day and friends and just, you know, helping me out. This is a shot at Riverside. That's me on the bike. And uh, Riverside obviously no longer there, but fun to be there. This was Cycle Magazine, this was 1991, and this was the very first superbikes, the Cafe Racers written by David Dewhurst. He did four motorcycles. Uh, he got in touch with me, said he'd like to feature the Dunstall. David is uh, from England, knew all about it. We took the bike to a studio and he wrote the article about uh, the Dunstall. Uh, that Vincent right there belongs to Jay Leno. And I had a chance to meet Jay Leno and showed him this picture. And he definitely said, that's my bike. And he knew a lot of history about my bike too, or the Dunstall Norton A10. So. Jay is a very legitimate expert on motorcycles and cars. Absolutely. Does he have one, a Dunstall? I, Jay does not have a Dunstall oh. to my knowledge, uh, but he was very proud of his Vincent, so. Need to work on that. Phil. I need to work on that. <laughs> I need to work on that, Jay. I'm coming mm -hmm. your way. And this was the article that started uh, a lot. This was my ride, a dirt bike kid gets his dream motorcycle. So there's the picture of me at the track side appropriately set right in front of an ambulance. Yeah, great. <laughs> and there's a picture of me just a couple years ago sitting on the bike as you see it now. So tried to duplicate how I was sitting and you know, suddenly this guy's a gray haired dude and doesn't have the leathers anymore, but there it is. Oh, this picture right here was the first ride, the first fire and the first ride took off on the street. Here we go, giddy up. So that was very, very special moment. And here's a picture of us 
uh, about the time we did the Wall Street Journal article, that's my wife, Linda, who was my girlfriend at the time that took those pictures back in 1972. Wow. At any rate, I thought that might be of interest to somebody just looking back in history. You know, people have asked me, um, what's the difference between a original Dunstall Norton A10 or maybe a kit form? And really there were three ways to get a Dunstall Norton. This is the complete bike. This customization was done by Paul Dunstall and the organization. But at the same time, Paul had been a racer and then got into speed tuning and manufacturing. And that's when it grew to Paul Dunstall buying. This was originally a brand new 750 Commando right from Norton. So that bike came to him and then he did all the customization work that you see on it. Uh, another way to do it would, people could buy right out of the magazines, you could buy the kits. And so anybody at home could quit on whatever parts that they wanted. So it's hard to tell differences. Again, I know it's original, I'm the original owner, but this is the complete bike. So of the three ways, this is right from Dunstall. Um, it's pointed out, just point something out here for the, uh, for the critical eye. This color is a little bit different right here uh, than the tank and the fairing. And it was that way right out of the crate. Um, I noticed that my first pictures I have, it was off and I was okay with that, just left it, but it hasn't been repainted. Uh, nothing like that, that's all, uh, that's all original. And hearing from Paul Dunstall, uh, I brought along, uh, you know, the email, and uh, I'm not gonna read the whole email, but uh, there was a few things in here I thought were interesting. Paul was, became famous as the cafe racer and then the speed tuner and the producer of these bikes. Dunstall prepared bikes were beating the factory Norton bikes. Paul says he enjoyed working with Norton, although initially they were in competition. They weren't the best pleased when Dunstall Norton race bikes were beating their work Norton racers. But when Dennis Poor acquired Norton, that all changed and invites to lunch in the boardroom with Dennis carving the joint became a weekly habit. Thereafter, I supplied three stages of Dunstall tuning kits, which Norton sold through their dealerships. So that would be another avenue to be able to get a Dunstall Norton was through a Norton dealer and with the supplied kits. Then after that, this was the last of the British superbikes, and the Japanese were on their way. And Paul says, I guess the Japanese became aware of the demand for cafe racer type motorcycles that I was producing because I had approaches from Kawasaki, Suzuki, and Honda. On launch in the Suzuki GS1000, Suzuki gained the title of fastest motorcycle in the world. But within months, Honda launched their 1000cc six cylinder and grabbed the fastest title. For the UK, Suzuki invited me to produce a Dunstall. Suzuki GS1000, which immediately regained the fastest title. Paul actually, in the email to me, he kind of added with this. I just love this. There were great times. I would weigh them as never having done a day's work in my life. I've always did exactly what I wanted to do, including long hours and sometimes all night sessions with the race bikes, but that wasn't work. It was interesting, stimulating, and enjoyable. So on a personal note, Paul, I'm gonna send you the link and uh, from a from a kid that has this bike to this day. I want to thank you for your bit of history with bikes and well done. The ritual of the Norton. <laughs> now I got to make sure I got key off, got to kick it at least once, maybe twice. Key is off. Just a little primer. Okay, we'll go key on.
Thanks very much for watching guys. This has been another tale from the cul-de-sac. Please remember to subscribe and click the little bell and you'll get a notice whenever I release a new video, usually every Sunday morning and sometimes during the week. What do we have flying here? We got a little drone flying. Yes, yes. Yeah. Courtesy of Dave. Many thanks, Dave. Yeah. Well, what do you think, Dave? Did you? Our pilot I look for up. the day. I figured you're up there somewhere. <laughs> That's good. You don't want to be looking up. No, I don't want to be looking up. <laughs> no, I got it.